From teaching to medicine, Dr. Gabor Matei's almost 40-year career as a physician includes running a family practice clinic, as well as treating the terminally ill and drug addicts. Dr. Matei specializes on the connection between society and addiction and mental illness. He's the author of several books, including In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction, and Hold On to Your Kids, Why Parents Need to Matter More Than Peers. Today we hear excerpts from a speech by Dr. Matei, which he gave in November 2011 in Berkeley, California. It's very interesting to, uh, to look at the United States from the outside, of course, because uh, your politicians are always saying, what a great country, the greatest country in the world, they all want to be like us, you know. And I want to ask you this question, psychological question. If you met some guy who kept telling you how great he was, and everybody wants to be like him, well, how would you diagnose him? Psychologically? You know, he's got a grandiose personality disorder. In other words, what he's actually doing is compensating for his deep insecurity. So that uh, this is a country that, in its very rhetoric, betrays extraordinary insecurity. Now, I grew up in communist Hungary, <laughs> where the joke, of course, was, what is capitalism? Capitalism is the exploitation of man by man. And what is communism? It's opposite. <laughs> I grew up in a system that spoke the language of socialism, that spoke the language of struggle, of anti-imperialism, of uh, equality and justice, but if its actual functioning uh, was just the very opposite. And then I came to North America, you know, after the Hungarian Revolution, which was really an uh, uprising against a very brutal dictatorship, and came to North America, and I bought into the American idea. And that lasted for exactly four years, uh, between 1957 and the early 60s, when the Vietnam War started. And what became very clear to me is that everything that the Soviets had said about the Americans were true, and everything they said about themselves were a total, total set pack of lies. So that the powers that be are oppressive and unjust. It's just how it is. And it doesn't matter in what guise. And this is not, a, by the way, an anti-communist rant. I may be one of the only two Marxists I know who came out of Eastern Europe. <laughs> And the reason I say that is when they beat you up with the head in the name of a certain system, you're not going to be going for that system very much. And what I've got you come to understand that it's really important for people to search for the truth themselves and not to automatically identify with any particular system. Because as soon as you start to identify, as soon as you try to find the, onside, the answer outside yourself, you, you may surrender your critical faculties. So if we hold on to our critical faculties and look at the truth, what do we see? In this society, what we see is a society that literally makes people sick. Because 50% of North American adults have a chronic illness. Uh, either diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease or cancer or any, any number of autoimmune illnesses. Now, according to the strict medical model, that's too bad. These people are just unfortunate because what the medical model does, whether with mental illness or physical illness, it makes two separations. It separates the mind from the body so that what happens to us emotionally is not seen to have an impact on our physical health, number one. And number two, it separates individuals from their environment so that we try to understand individuals in separation from their actual lives so that if somebody has cancer, well, that's just their bad luck or maybe because they smoke too many cigarettes, which leaves us completely bereft of understanding what causes most of disease. And what they're betraying there is the complete poverty of understanding of what makes the human brain tick and what creates a human being and what causes people to behave and to function and to feel the way they actually do. Now, those separations are uh, socially imposed, they're culturally defined, and scientifically they're completely invalid. Because the truth of it is that the traditional teachings of shamanic medicinal cultures around the world and of traditional Chinese medicine or Ayurvedic Indian medicine, that mind and body are inseparable, have not been validated by modern science. So my profession 
although it claims to ground itself in science and what they call evidence-based practice, I only wish. I only wish they looked at the actual evidence. I only wish they would ask themselves, why is it that in the United States, an Afro-American male has six times the risk of dying of prostate cancer than a Caucasian? Well, it's got to be genetic. No, it isn't, because their genetic relatives in Africa don't suffer the same risk at all. So what is it in this society? Why are black women, even middle-class black women, more likely to suffer miscarriages in this country? Well, that's not a genetic question. It's a social question. There's something's going on here. If you look at something like the rate of autism in this country, or in, um, in, in industrial society, but particularly in North America, has gone up 40-fold in the last 50 years, or is it 30-fold in the last 30 years? Well, you know you can't be dealing with the genetic effect. Because genes don't change in a population over 30 years or even 500 years. There's got to be something going on in society that's driving the emotional ill health of children. And furthermore, if you look at addictions, there's a couple of myths associated with it. One of them is that it's a choice that people make. And the criminal justice system, which I think is a very apt uh, way of putting it, it's a criminal system. The justice system is criminal. It's based on the very idea that people are making choices when they become addicts. If they're not making choices, why punish them for it? And the other idea is that it's genetic. And the third idea, of course, is that drugs are addictive, which is inherently nonsense. Because if it was true, then anybody who tried the drug should become addicted. But most people who try most drugs don't become addicted. Most people who try cigarettes don't become nicotine addicts. Most people who have a drink don't become alcoholics. Most people who try heroin, crystal meth, or cocaine don't become addicts. The real question is, why are the drugs addictive to certain people? What creates the susceptibility? What makes them vulnerable? When the American army came back from Vietnam, fully 20% of the GIs were addicted to heroin. A few years later, only 1% was. There was a 95% cure rate, if you wish. Now, if in my work with drug addicted clients in the downtown east side of Vancouver, I had a 6% cure rate or a 16% cure rate, I'd be recognized as an international genius because the, the cure rates are really, really low. How come 95% of these GIs, if the drugs are addictive in themselves, manage to uh, overcome their addiction? Well, maybe you have to look at their lives. And maybe you have to look at the circumstances under which they became addicted. Furthermore, if you look at the uh, aboriginal populations of North America, these people actually had uh, potentially addictive substances available to them. Not only were they available, they used them. There was peyote, there was alcoholic spirits in New Mexico. There was, of course, tobacco. But there was no addiction. If the substances in themselves had been addictive, and if these people were genetically predisposed, either or, they should have been addicted. But there was no history of addiction prior to the coming of the Caucasians. As a matter of fact, the natives used these plants, but what did they use them for? They used them in spiritual ways. In other words, they used them to elevate their level of consciousness, whereas the very essence of addiction is to uptund your level of consciousness because you don't, want, you don't want to be aware. So addiction is an escape from awareness, whereas the spiritual use of these substances is the enhancement of, of, of awareness. Now, if choice and genetics don't explain it, now we'd have to look at history. We'd have to actually ask, what happened to the native people in this part of the world that drove them into addiction? Now, alcohol has been known in uh, the Western world for thousands of years, and there was plenty of drunkenness, even in ancient times. But there was no alcoholism, for the most part. Alcoholism came around in the 18th century with the rise of capitalism. You can make a very good case that one of the medical outcomes or one of the health outcomes of capitalism is addiction. In other words, can you understand people in isolation from the system in which they live? Well, the answer is that you can't. First of all, because the biology of human beings is shaped by the psychological and social environment in which they live. I can give you one example, uh, asthma. It's well known now, not controversial, that children whose parents are stressed are more likely to have asthma. Now, ask the average physician, what's the connection? They'd have no idea. And yet, if you ask the physician, how do you treat the asthma? 
You know how you treat the asthma? With stress hormones. <laughs> With adrenaline and cortisol, or copies of it. This is how you treat asthma. I'm not going to go into the reasons why, but shouldn't the very fact that we're treating this condition with stress hormones cause us to ask maybe stress has something to do with it? So in a polluted area where children are more likely to have asthma, it's the children of stressed parents who are much more likely to have asthma. Simply because the emotional stresses of the parents disorganize the stress response mechanisms of the child. And when women are stressed during pregnancy, their children have abnormal stress hormone levels, more likely to use addictive substances to soothe their stresses. That's because the emotional states of the parents have something to do with the physiology of the child. That's just how it works, because you can't separate the mind from the body, and you can't separate the individual from the environment. Now, if you look at um, the parameters of stress, what is it that stresses people? The research shows that what, what's most stressful for people is uncertainty, lack of information, loss of control, and lack of opportunity to express yourself. Now, when Karl Marx talked about freedom, he talked about freedom in three senses of the word. Freedom for him was, number one, freedom from economic necessities, freedom from the threat to life. Freedom from interference by other people, and the freedom to express yourself, to be yourself. That's freedom. Now, what freedom is there in this free society, you know, the free world, the freest society in history? What freedom is there when people are not free of economic worry, where there's tremendous uncertainty and fear, lack of control? Where when people lack control over their lives, they have no freedom. And they're physiologically stressed. And when they're physiologically stressed, that's going to manifest in the form of illness. So if you look at the California-based studies called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Studies, it looked at 18,000 people, 80% Caucasians, 10% Hispanics, 10% Afro-Americans. And they looked at what happened to them in childhood and what the, ch the adult ad outcomes were. And an, and an Adverse Childhood Experience was something like physical, sexual, or emotional abuse, the loss of a parent due to a death, being jailed or a rancorous divorce violence in the family, uh, addiction in the family. For each of these adverse childhood experiences, the risk of addiction went up by two to four fold. So by the time a male child had had six of these experiences, his risk of becoming an injection using substance addict was 4,600% greater than that of a male child with no such experiences. So the risk of mental illness goes up exponentially. The risk of um, Physical illness, like autoimmune disease, goes up exponentially. And in Canadian studies, it's been shown when children are abused in childhood, their cancer risk goes up by nearly 50%. Why? Because you can't separate the mind from the body, and you can't separate individuals from the psychosocial environment. But if we understand human beings in their psychosocial context, what do we see? We see that stress is not just an abstract psychological event. It has physiological correlates. So when you're stressed, your whole body um, homeostasis or the internal balance is perturbed. And fundamentally, you have disturbance of the nervous system, increase in the heart rate, blood pressure, and in the stress hormones, cortisol and adrenaline, which play their job in helping you escape or to fight back in the face of an acute threat. But if you're chronically stressed, they actually create disease, thin your bones, suppress your immune system, give you heart disease, high blood pressure, diabetes, whole range of health conditions. You're listening to Dr. Gabor Mate speaking in November 2011 in Berkeley, California. You're listening to Making Contact, a production of the National Radio Project. If you'd like more information or four CD copies of this program, please call 800-529-5736. Because of listeners like you, this show is distributed for free to radio stations in the U.S., Canada, and South Africa. To find out how to support us, download shows, or get our podcasts, go to radioproject.org. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Our handle is making underscore contact. We now return to hear more of Dr. Gabor Mate speaking about the connection between society, addiction, and illness. Now, when it comes to addiction and specifically, uh, 
in the downtown side of Vancouver, I never had a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child. And as were many of the men. And so it's always, the heart of addiction is always emotional loss. And the obvious ones are those losses incurred by those adverse childhood experiences identified in this California study. But there's another side to it as well. Because if you look at what's happening with this burgeoning number of children being diagnosed with this or that disorder, not all of them were abused. Many of them were not. But what's going on? Well, as D.W. Winnicott, the great British child psychiatrist, pointed out, there's two things that can go wrong in childhood. First of all, when things, go, things happen that shouldn't happen, and that's the abuse and the trauma. And secondly, when things don't happen that should happen, and that's the presence of non-stressed, non-depressed, emotionally attuned, available caregivers. That's not available in a country where the average maternity leave is six and a half weeks. That's not available where kids spend most of the time away from the nurturing adults in their lives in the company of other kids so that they're forced to look to each other as their attachment figures. The desperation of kids to always connect. The sense of disorientation they feel when they can't connect with their friends by some electronic means. It's not a technological problem. It's an attachment problem. Those, people, those kids have been disconnected from the adults in their lives because the adults are not there for them. They can't be. They're too stressed. And there was a study a few weeks ago that showed that stressed parents, not unloving parents, but stressed parents simply are not as attuned to the emotional cues of their kids as they like to be. And that's what the, the psychologist formerly at UCLA, Alan Shore, calls proximal separation. Proximal separation is when the parent is physically there but emotionally unavailable because they're too stressed and too distracted. And that's what my children experienced when they were small because I was a workaholic physician. And this society rewards workaholism. They tell you what a great guy you are. They reward you for the very things that undermine the health of your family. And for a lot of people, it's not even a question of a choice. When under the sainted and behaloed Bill Clinton, the... Uh, the welfare laws were changed so that mothers could have only a number of years on welfare, then they had to go to work. Now, where exactly does a single welfare mother go to work? Well, usually at a low-paying job far away from home where she has to commute for an hour or two. And all that time that she's working and all that time that she's commuting, her child is in some daycare, inadequately staffed, with undertrained uh, personnel. But what is that, who does that kid got to connect to then? The other kids. And the children become each other's uh, uh, connection uh, foci. And that means that for the first time in history, you have large numbers of kids, immature creatures, getting their modeling and their cue giving and their sense of direction and sense of values and how to walk and how to talk from other immature creatures. But what do you expect in that culture but all kinds of dysfunction? And again, that's not an individual choice that parents have made. That's just another way in which this system has undermined the necessary conditions for child development. A study out of Notre Dame University last year showed that the healthiest environment actually for um, child rearing is the hunter-gatherer society, hunter-gatherer village. And why? Because in the hunter-gatherer village, three things happen to kids that don't happen in our culture anymore for many, many kids. Number one, the kid's always with the parent. Well, that's not possible in this country. You know, civilized countries actually have paternity leave. Never mind the six-week maternity leave. When the Puritans arrived in North America, they were appalled at the parenting practices of the natives. Do you know why? Because the natives didn't beat their kids. And to the Christians, this meant sparing the rod, spoiling the child. So that's the first thing. The second thing is when kids cried, they were picked up. Imagine that, picking up a kid when he's crying. <laughs> we're telling people at five months, when kids are five months, six months, don't pick them up. You want, to, you want them to become independent. <laughs> we're missing the point that the way to promote independence is to invite <laughs> dependence. Because people become independent when they feel secure in the world. So you promote independence by inviting dependence. 
But so the you know so these Aboriginal cultures they picked up kids when they were crying, which meant that the kids' brains don't become overwhelmed by the stress hormones. When a child's brain becomes overwhelmed by stress hormones because he's not picked up, that has all kinds of impacts on the child's brain development because the brain develops an interaction with the environment. So even if you don't abuse kids in our in this country, but if you just follow the parenting practices recommended by the so-called experts, you're going to screw up your kids tremendously. And the third quality of the hunter-gatherer society is that children are brought up in the context of nurturing adults, not just the parents, not just the father, not just the mother, but that clan, tribe, community, and neighborhood that I was talking about before. So any system that destroys those conditions, that stresses the parents, see if we think it's genetic, we don't have to ask what happened to black people in this country and what are the stresses on black males that, 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 that trigger their prostate cancers. We don't have to look at what happened to the native people in this country that triggers their addictions or to many other people, native or black or, or Caucasian or whoever. It's all in the genes is an explanation for the way things are that does not threaten the way things are. Why should someone feel unhappy or engage in antisocial behavior when that person is living in the freest and most prosperous nation on earth. It can't be the system. There must be a flaw in the wiring somewhere. And finally, let me just read you a quote from another chapter of my book on addiction. Detective Sergeant Paul Gillespie, head of Toronto Sex Crimes Unit, rescued children from the purveyors of internet pornography. As the Global Mail reported on his retirement from police work, six years at that job had not inured him to the to the horrors that he witnessed. And this guy made it his job to find out where in the world was it happening that this child was being abused on the net. Then he retired and a newspaper wrote, Paul Gillespie still can't get used to the sounds of crying and pain in the graphic videos of children being raped and molested that he has seen all too often on the web. It's beyond horrible to listen to the soundtracks of these movies said Canada's best known child porn cop. Whereas the silent images of desolate children that tear most at his heart. They're not screaming, just accepting, he said, of the infants captured in his pictures. They have dead eyes. You can tell that their spirit is broken. That's their life. Why the dead eyes? The dead eyes, because the child can't escape, fight back, or seek help. The only way that they can possibly endure the trauma is to shut down their emotion and awareness of the pain. In this society, we have a massive emotional shutdown. And you can see it in the increasing violence in the culture. You can see it in the increasing violence in the media culture, that gory movies have to be more and more gory. Sports have to be more violent. People now have to beat each other to a pulp on television. Because we're so emotionally shut down, it takes more and more to titillate us. And the sex has to be more and more objectified, more and more um, salacious, really because what used to excite people decades ago is no longer sufficient. Why? Because we're shutting down. Why are we shutting down? Because we hurt so much. And the more, we, and the more we shut down, the more we need external sources of stimulation to make us feel anything at all. Now, in the case of the abuse child, of course, the shutdown is obvious as to why it's happening. But the second point is that if that same cop, instead of quitting the force, had transferred to the drug squad, According to all the research, who do you think you'd be chasing in the streets? Those same kids that he didn't rescue. Because according to all the research and the brain developmental data, they're the ones who become the street drug addicts. Because they're the ones who are in so much pain that they have to soothe themselves with drugs. And then what do we do? We take people who are abused to start with, and then we make them the social enemy. And they're the ones who make up our jail population. So when we, didn't, we try and rescue them if we can, and if we fail to rescue them, then we persecute them for the rest of their lives. And that's what we're doing with this war on drugs. And there's no war on drugs, because you can't war on inanimate objects. There's only a war on drug addicts, which means that we're warring on the most abused and vulnerable segments of the population. And we could argue left and right what a failure the war on drugs has been, because you can see that it's not working. But you know what? I have a different point of view. If decade after decade after decade, the stated intentions of our policies are not being realized, in fact, the very opposite is happening, then is it really a failure or maybe is it serving some purpose? 
Maybe it's serving the purpose of maintaining the rationale, the raison d'etre of law enforcement uh, and, 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 and a repressive apparatus that can, then can be used against the people when the need arises. Maybe it, uses, maybe it has the function of demonizing a certain section of the population and increasing the fear in the rest of the population that justifies more repression. Maybe it has the function of keeping a whole legal apparatus going. Maybe it has the function of making a lot of money for a lot of people. Maybe it has the function of uh, fueling the privatized incarceration industry. So maybe after all, it's not such a failure at all. And from that perspective, was the Vietnam War a failure? No, it wasn't. It was lost militarily. But the end result was that the U.S. still gets to control the economies of Southeast Asia. Is the Iraq war failure? Well, it is for the people who died there, for the half a million Iraqis or a million who have, whose lives are lost, but it's not a failure for the American oil companies. So that every war, we have to be careful before we call them failures. Somebody wins. The somebody who wins are the same people who are destroying neighborhoods and communities. It's the same system that undermines human health, that undermines uh, human dignity, that undermines human connection, that really makes life less tolerable on our planet. Now, we don't have to agree on what the solutions might be, and that's okay. What we do agree on is the importance of speaking the truth. What we do agree on is the importance of people getting together and struggling in a healthy way for a different life. Because if it's the loss of control and the isolation and the suppression of self-expression that are the greatest causes of stress, then surely one answer to the stress of this culture is to get together and to express ourselves and not to be silent and to connect with other human beings. Or as Joe Hill said, don't mourn, organize. Thank you very much.